We're continuing our series in the book of Nahum. Today we're looking at chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. And I wanted to read together our passage today. Nahum chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. So if you have the NIV with you, the version, New International Version, I'd like us to read together. So shall we rise in honor of God's word as we read Nahum, Nahum chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. 11. Together in the NIV. Woe to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims. The crack of whips, the clatter of wheels, galloping horses and jolting chariots, charging cavalry, flashing swords and glittering spears, many casualties, piles of dead, bodies without number people stumbling over the corpses, all because of the wanton lust of a harlot, alluring the mistress of sorceries who enslaved nations by her prostitution and peoples by her witchcraft. I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. I will pelt you with filth I will treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. All who see you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is in ruins, who will mourn for her? Where can I find anyone to comfort you? Are you better than Thebes, situated on the Nile with water around her? The river was her defense, the waters her wall. Cush and Egypt were her boundless strength. Put and Libya were among her allies, yet she was taken captive and went into exile. Her infants were dashed to pieces at the head of every street. Lots were cast for her nobles, and all her great men were put in chains. You too will become drunk. You will go into hiding and seek refuge from the enemy. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. Please be seated. You know, some things in life, when you combine together, they form amazing things. Earlier on, we were looking at God's loving kindness and jealousy, and when you bring them together, you have this incredible exclusive marriage covenant. Many things come in pairs, twins, for example, when you combine the appropriate amount of hydrogen with the appropriate amount of oxygen, you form what? Water. water. Right, that's right. H2O or water, correct? I've heard also that when the solar wind, whatever that is, the solar wind disturbs this certain sphere around planet Earth called the magnetosphere, when the solar wind disturbs this spherical shaped atmosphere called a magnet, a magnetic field, it actually forms this thing, as we know, the aurora borealis. Like these things that you see, of course, it's not all over the world. It's usually at the northern end of certain continents, right? The aurora borealis. So, there are also some bad combinations in life. For example, when you have very dry conditions, right? And you have a cigarette butt that still somehow has its embers and you throw it into the forest or really dry field. That's dangerous, right? Because it is very combustible and that could create a huge fire. A few weeks ago, I was watching the movie, The Nutty Professor. You familiar with that movie? The original. Jerry Lewis, right? He was the professor, and he was in this class, a laboratory. And in that class, of course, he's teaching chemistry. And he combined what looked like gas and a certain chemical. And when he mixed that together, guess what? Of course, a mighty explosion that somehow devastated not just the classroom, but a big chunk of the campus. In our text today, 
Nahum actually describes another deadly combination. And that combination is power and pride. When these two are mixed together, the devastation is quite unimaginable. You know, it isn't hard to imagine the extent of cruelty I can get into. Just with the proper environment you place me into, my pride might get into the way, my anger might suddenly emerge, my old nature will easily come across. Just given the right environment, it's not hard to imagine what types of cruelty you and I can get into. You see, the Bible portrays repeatedly a certain sinister, insidious pattern that when not checked will lead one to fierceness. And the end is always predictable in such an environment. We know that God hates it, and he will not allow these things to be unaccounted for. So look at Nineveh's assertion. What we don't read in the passage of Nahum is something quite critical to the country, the nation of Assyria. Because this is a serious boast. And today you looked at Zephaniah, didn't you? In Zephaniah 2, chapter 2, verse 15, listen to Nineveh, the Washington, D.C., of Assyria. Listen to the boast. This is the exultant city which dwells securely, who says in her heart, I am, and there is no one besides me. That sounds like the words of the Lord himself. But it is Nineveh who's proclaiming. Isaiah chapter 10, verses 13 and 14 also says this. Assyria, Nineveh speaking, he has said, By the power of my hand and by my wisdom I did this. For I have understanding... I remove the boundaries of the peoples. I plunder their treasures. And like a mighty man, I brought down their inhabitants. And my hand reached the riches of the people like a nest. And as one gathers abandoned eggs, I gathered all the earth. And there was not one that flapped its wing or opened its beak or even chirped. That's how great I am. Now here's how God looks and deals with such declarations. Isaiah 10 verse 15 says this, Is the axe to boast itself over the one who chops with it? Is the saw to exalt, exalt itself over the one who wields it? That's why the title of today's message is The Heir of an Axe. The axe has a head, and that head has air. Here's how God looks at that acts with such air. When you add sinful pride with superpower, the sum can be deadly. And today we'll look at three deadly outcomes. The first outcome is this. There's going to be fun with rage. You see, a striking thing about Assyria is this. She's called Blood City. She's known to be quite a violent place to live in. In my mind, it's the original Transylvania, where Count Dracula and his vampires used to live. They suck the blood out of you, and they have fun. The gladiators look like amateurs among the brutal and most violent Assyrian armed forces. You see, gruesome blood was the rule of the game. And the more blood spilt, the louder the applause. Can you imagine? The more blood, the louder the applause. And so in verse 1, it says, You're full of lies. You're full of plunder. You're never without victims. What does it mean? These strokes of violence. You see, there is no shame. There is no guilt in their double talk. In their lies, they boast when they deceive. Instead of feeling shameful and guilty for their manipulative ways, they actually glory 
in their shrewd ways. You know what I'm saying? In our parlance in Filipino, we say, na isahan ko siya. I got one over him or her. And you know what? The way we say it is as if we're boasting. That in the way we have, have done you in, we boast. It's the same thing. They were full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims. Corruption, plunder is the game they play. And guess what? There's a huge market for it. They play easily into their hands. And so they're grabbing everything they wish. They grab lands, they grab homes, they grab beautiful young girls because of their power. And so they're like a lion. They're feasting on the prey. They prowl and then go for the kill. Totally unbridled violence. And so as long as there are weak people, as long as there are vulnerable people, as long as there are powerless, helpless people, these Ninevites devour to their heart's delight. Full of lies. Deceiving. Manipulating. Scheming. You know, there's a relationship between lying and pride. Did you know that? You see, proud people makes us liars. Most of the lies that are told in the world are somehow to avoid some disgrace. We lie because we want to hide things. We lie so that we are not found out for who we really are. Maybe there's disgrace, there's shame in us, and therefore we simply lie. We lie because we don't want to get men to think that we are lower than they are. And so when a sin is committed against God, or a sin is committed against our superiors, instead of humble confession, pride would cover it with a lie. They're strokes of violence. They're full of lies, full of plunder. Always tons of victims. And here's what it continues to say in verse 4. It's seduction. When they lie, they actually seduce, they allure. It's like they're throwing in baits in order to somehow attract more and more victims. Verse 4 actually says this, all because of the wanton lust of a prostitute Alluring, the mistress of sorceries who enslaved nations by her prostitution and peoples by her witchcraft. In other words, Nineveh utilizes two immoral baits in life. It's like they're going out fishing and they have these two worms that are incredible in terms of alluring the fish. And you know what those two baits are? It's simple. It's harlotry and sorcery. Now, in today's world, you might think, oh, we're not into harlotry, we're not into sorcery, are we? Well, here's what it looks like. You see, Nineveh was the center of the cult, and the cult god that they had is called Ishtar. In fact, you come across that name Ishtar in some parts of the Bible when it talks about the Assyrian god, Ishtar. And you know what? Ishtar is actually fashioned as a prostitute. Ishtar, their god, is a harlot. Now, if you have a god that is a harlot, guess what kinds of people the followers will become? You know, somebody has said, you actually become like the god you worship. And so here you have, their idol is a harlot, and so they learn the tricks of allurement, enticement, manipulative ways to exploit others for personal profit. And when they do, they enslave so many by her prostitution. And so she exploits nations through her deceitful promises, through her commitments and treaties and agreements only later on. They would only drain them systematically of their own wealth because they're master manipulators. You know what the Bible says? Proverbs 6, verses 16 to 19. There are six things the Lord hates, 
Seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes or a proud look. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked schemes. Feet that are quick to rush into evil. A false witness who pours out lies. And the man who stirs up dissension among brothers. You know what? All of those sins. All of those things that the Lord hates were committed by the powerful and the proud in the person of the king of Assyria, in the country and the nation of Assyria. When power and pride come together and it is left unchecked, we're going to have fun with rage. And we're not going to be even be aware that we're having fun. That's the one thing we learn in this passage. But there's a second thing. The deadly outcome is the face of shame. In verse 1, it says, Woe! Woe to the city of blood. That's doom. And in verse 2 says this, the crack of whips, clatter of wheels, galloping horses, jolting chariots. What's going on? Charging cavalry, flashing swords, glittering spears, many casualties, piles of dead, bodies without number, people stumbling over the corpses. What's going on? It's Babylon. It's Babylon who has now emerged as a mighty nation who would now devour and wage war against you, Assyria. And here they come. You hear the sound of their fury. You hear the crack of the whip. You hear their chariots coming. You hear their horses coming. And corpses litter the landscape because there is no escape for you. And God says, verse 5, I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. See, here's Nineveh's destiny. Whip. You hear it? The clanging wheels, you hear them? Hoofbeats of horses. Look at the streets. Littered with carcasses of men, women, and children. That's who you are, Nineveh. That's who you are, bully Assyria. That's who you are, Ninevites. You're going to litter the streets by your bodies, now dead and decaying. And you know what? Babylon is coming over, but you know, more than that, it's not Babylon who's against you. Yahweh, the Lord of hosts, He is against you. He is the one who says, I am against you. And it's not simply the Lord who's against you, it's the Lord of hosts. You know, when we sing the song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, there's this phrase there that says something like, Lord Sabaoth, his name from age to age the same right Lord Sabaoth his name from age to age the same that word that phrase Lord Sabaoth that's actually a Hebrew word it's not Sabbath it's a Hebrew word that merely means the Lord of the angel armies the Lord of hosts the Lord Almighty as it is translated what it means is, yes, he's all-powerful. But more than that, he's the God who wages war. Whenever it's used, the Lord of hosts, he is the God who fights. And here he fights against those who bring themselves up, exalting themselves as if they themselves were God. And God says, I am against you. And I'm going to use Babylon, the Medians, against you. But I'm only going to use them because it is I who's against you. Woe to the city of blood. What kind of a God do we have? You see in verse 5, the second part, he says this. I lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. And it doesn't end there. I will pelt you with filth. I will treat you with contempt. I will make you a spectacle. Can you imagine? That is disgrace to the max. 
the face is covered because of shame. We call it face, uh, saving face, right? And in the process of covering the face, we undress ourselves, revealing even more nakedness. That's double shame. But it gets worse because we're not alone in the privacy of our rooms. In fact, in today's parlance, it's on Facebook and it's gone viral. And here's the thing. You're not the one doing it on yourself. God is. He acts so unilaterally and swiftly against the proud. You see, five times God acts to shame the proud. He says, I will lift your skirts. I will show the nations your nakedness. I will pelt you with filth. I will treat you with contempt. I will make you a spectacle. That's how he opposes the proud. Brothers and sisters, pride is not some little attitude that we may have that God ignores. The Bible tells us, James 4, 6. And they quote God because I think that's how the emphasis should be. They quote God rather than saying, you know what? God is against the proud. They quote God saying, God is opposed to the proud. And they're going to be disgraced if it remains unchecked. You know, when my son was in his first grade in Singapore, I had to take him to school. And because we were in a hurry, because he might be late, I went quickly as possible in the car. And as soon as I got into the queue or the line of cars to drop off the students, as soon as I was right there at the drop-off point, Gibby, my son, came down. And because I was in a hurry myself, this car in front of me wasn't moving at all. And so I thought, oh, I think I'm, I'm far enough from that car in front of me. And so I think I can swerve to the right. You see, you, you, you move to the right in Singapore, not the left. To the right to overtake uh, the right. So I swerved to the right thinking I had enough space. But in so doing, I scraped the bumper of the car in front of me. Oh, what shame. I'm in a hurry. I need to go. I can't stay there long. And I told myself, it's just a scrape. I mean, it's just, it's, I mean, there, there's no dent whatsoever. And so I went. I left without doing anything, without even putting my name and number on the windshield of the car. I just left. I said, that's nothing, right? Because I looked at the car, I looked at the bumper. Nah, that, that, that's nothing. As soon as I got home, I looked at my bumper and I saw, see, my car was colored gray. And the car I scratched was white. And so when I looked at the front bumper, I said, oh my, there's a white gash on my bumper. And so I thought, I hope the color of my car didn't remain in that car in front of me. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm in trouble, right? But you see, the conscience begins to crank up. And so my wife, who was volunteering in the school, she was there. And so I call her and I said, honey, is there somebody complaining about uh, <laughs> their car being hit? And he said, well, not really. But there is a car here, though, that seems to have the color of our own car in their bumper. <laughs> and he said, yeah, yeah, that's it. Is it white? Yes, it's white. Oh, dear, my honey tells me. She says, you know what? It's a Mercedes-Benz. I said, ooh, maybe I should confess. But maybe not. Maybe they're rich. But that's nothing. Maybe it's insured. That's nothing, right? Yeah, you know, all these things that are going into my mind. And then my, my wife also says, I, and you know, there's another thing. And I said, well, what's that? The owner of the car is the principal of the school. <laughs> Oh my goodness. And then I said, okay, I'm coming over. I'll own up to my wrongdoing. Apologize, make restitution, and perhaps pay if need be. You see, disgrace. I felt disgrace. I felt shame. But there's something we can do about it, right? All the time. Rather than flee it, we can do something about it. And the good news is, 
when I said, I'm the culprit. Just tell me what the damage is. We're willing to pray about it. <laughs> and the good news is, you see, the principal is a Christian. He said, oh, I'm a pastor. <laughs> right? And he says, don't worry about it. Forgiven. But what disgrace. What shame piled on top of each other. And if we don't do anything about these things, the time will come. There is no turning back. It will all be disgrace for you and for me. Verse 7 says this. All you, all who see you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is in ruins. Who will mourn for her? Where can I find anyone to comfort you? You know, that event actually happened in 612 BC. Of course, Nahum was simply prophesying, predicting the future. It hasn't happened yet. That's why we know Nahum was writing between 663 and 612 because Assyria hasn't fallen yet. And so this event happened in 612 BC and it's regarded one of the greatest riddles in world history. You know why? Because in a span of 80 years, Nineveh, which had been raised to somehow unrivaled prominence by Sennacherib. Remember that king? In Isaiah, you'll find Sennacherib over and over again. King of Assyria. Of course, Pastor Irwin said there's four kings. Sargon, Sennacherib, Esarhaddon, Ashurbanipal. You'll see all those names in the Bible. Well, Sennacherib, he's the great builder. Eighty years, Nineveh became nothing. From the time of glory within 80 years, it was obliterated from living memory. You see, Sennacherib boasted like this, not in the Bible, but in some extra-biblical source. In Assyrian documents, it says this, Sennacherib had this to say, Nineveh, the noble metropolis, the city beloved of Ishtar, wherein are all the meeting places of gods and goddesses, the everlasting substructure, the eternal foundation, whose plan had been designed from of old, whose structure had been made beautiful along with the firmament of heaven. This was a glorious place. And you know what? Since 612, when Nineveh had fallen, for the next 300 years, you know what? Nobody even knew that such a city existed right there, where we know now as Mosul. There's a, a modern-day excavator by the name of Layard, and he was excavating Nineveh, and he wrote this as follows. We've been fortunate enough to acquire the most convincing, lasting evidence of that magnificence and power which made Nineveh the wonder of the ancient world, and her fall the theme of the prophets as the most signal instance of divine vengeance. Without the evidence that these monuments afford, we might also have doubted that the great Nineveh ever existed. It's true. It's history. So completely has she become a desolation and a waste. And so the question, if you're a Ninevite back then and you hear a message like this, something that hasn't happened yet, the question to you and me is this, do you believe that this God who hates pride, who is opposed and wages war against pride, tells you that your destiny is devastation? Do you believe? You are the superpower. Nothing wrong with power. But stain it and taint it with pride. Your end is predictable. So here's the proof of disgrace. You don't believe me? Nahum says. Look at verse 8. Are you better than Thebes? Of course, we don't know what Thebes is, but they knew what Thebes was. 
situated on the Nile. So it's a city in the Nile with water around her. The river was her defense, the waters her wall. Kush, which is today Ethiopia. Kush and Egypt were her boundless strength. Pot and Libya were among her allies. So what's Thebes? Thebes, Thebes. Thebes is the city of Ammon, and Ammon was their god. Ammon was the chief god in the Thebian pantheon of gods. And here we know that Thebes actually lay 400 miles south of Cairo, modern-day Cairo, Egypt. In my mind, Thebes is actually the original twin cities of the day because the city was found, one on the west bank of the Nile, the other on the east bank of the Nile. It was the leading center of Egyptian civilization. And therefore, in your mind, you can imagine. You see the obelisks. You see the sphinxes, right? You see the palaces and temples. All those were in there, and they are described as the world's first great monumental city. And so, they were so similar to Nineveh. Now, like Nineveh, Thebes was surrounded not only by natural defenses like the waters, but they were also surrounded by allies. Ethiopia, Egypt, Libya, they were all part of the G3 or the G4. Wow. So Thebes was conquered by Assyria in 663 BC. So now picture this. Nahum is saying, Ninevites, do you remember? 663 BC. You conquered Thebes. You did to it exactly what's going to happen to you in 612 BC. That's why we know Nahum is in between these dates. And you don't believe me? There's Thebes. You've ransacked, plundered. Thebes is going to happen to you. Look at your faith. Verse 10. Yet she was taken captive. Thebes went into exile. Her infants were dashed to pieces at every street corner. These are the mighty Assyrians. They were the ones in the Bible who actually took their babies and held them in their legs, in their ankles, and began to swung those babies, swing those babies to hit the head by rocks. These were the original ones. The Babylonians did that as well. And that's why in Psalm 137, the imprecatory prayer of that psalmist, Oh, may that happen to you too, Babylonians. May God dash your infants against the rocks. God is a God of vengeance. See, that kind of fate is yours, Nineveh. You see, for all the beauty that was Thebes, for all the strength that was Thebes, she fell to mighty Assyria. That's why King Ashurbanipal had this to say, this city, Thebes, the whole of it, I conquered with the help of Ishtar. Silver, gold, great horses, supervising men and women. Two obelisks of splendid electrum, weighing 2,500 talents. The doors of temples, I tore from their bases. I carried them off to Assyria. And with this weighty booty, I left Thebes. Against Egypt and Cush, I have lifted my spear, shown my power with full hands. I have returned to Nineveh in good health. What you did to Thebes, God will do to you. You see here, Nahum's description of a city scattered to the winds. No more posterities because there are no babies. Its trained nobles plundered. Its leaders fleeing for refuge. And from that time onward, it's been largely a place of monuments to a glory and dominance now long departed. This is like what was known of Jerusalem when the glory of God departed. They shout out, Ichabod, no glory. It's gone. Power and pride. 
they are intoxicating. To have power is not a sin, but to mix it with sinful pride, the elixir is deadly. You see, there's a disease that makes others sick except the carrier. You hear that? There's a disease that makes everyone sick except the carrier. And that sickness is called pride. It's hard for people like me to know when I am proud. It's never easy to be so self-aware when we nurture pride. And you see, one of the most dangerous qualities of pride is that it sneaks into places in our hearts that were once the dwelling place of sin. In our lives, we, we still sin and we still have our old Adam living in us. And the more we surrender to the work of the Spirit of God, the more victorious we are. Sin still resides, forgiven, yes. Under control, yes, when the Spirit of God is in us. But you see, when pride comes into our own hearts, those sins that are still there but are just latent, they're like cancer cells. And I've been told that we all have cancer cells, by the way. That's not bad news. But many of those are malignant. Many of those are no, not malignant, benign. Many of those cells are not going to grow so quickly that it kills you. You'll die of something else. But some cells, some cancer cells, grow fast. And so our hearts are like that. We may have the cancer cell, but it doesn't grow fast. Our sins are like that. It doesn't really emerge. It doesn't grow out of us. But the tendency is always there. But like a cancer cell, when we allow pride into our hearts, it awakens all those sins that we keep in our hearts. It is like, I'm going to eat as much steak as I want, as much kare kare as I want, as much processed spam that I want. And you know, when I do that, I bring in those things that make alive the cancer cells in me. And pride is like that. When we bring it into our lives, those tendencies that have been somehow made quiet begin to come alive. And the results become deadly. So if we battle some sins, but welcome pride, we will lose the war. But if we suffocate pride, we will starve every other sin of its oxygen. And that is what the Assyrians could not do. They come to a place where there is no return for such power and for such pride. And so what is the end result? The third deadly outcome, it's a fall from grace. Because 150 years before, Jonah preached and the Ninevites repented. They had no idol named Ishtar because they knew what the Lord, Yahweh himself, wanted. And yet, in 150 years' time, it was all over. Repentance no more. We're back to our old, original ways. And guess what? They were intoxicated once again. They were under a spell. You too will become drunk. We know it as driving under the influence. You see, as a bloody city, a whore city, a sin city, 
the unimaginable happens because they're under the influence of evil in the form of sinful pride added to their superpowers. He says, you will go into hiding. Nahum says, and you, when you go into hiding, you'll be looking for holes in the cliffs, in the ground, anywhere that you could find. But you know what? You will still be found out. You'll go into hiding, but you will still be found out, much like Saddam Hussein, who was found in a spider hole under the ground. It is only shoulder deep. It's not very deep. It had a protective lid on top, camouflaged that lid, and yet he was still found out. You will go into hiding, but you're going to be found out. You're going to seek refuge from the enemy. Now, finding no refuge anywhere, this can result in two things. Safety by surrender to the enemy. But they know very well to surrender to the enemy actually meant you're going to die. They're going to kill you anyway. So the result is certain death. The other option is to find safety by disguise. Right? Right? And so I'm going to wear a mask. I'm going to be somebody who looks like you. I'm going to speak like you. I'm going to hide my identity. But the point is this. All hideouts are found. All masquerading will be laid bare. There is no escape. The higher the height of your flight, the deeper the depth of your plunge. That's why Zechariah in chapter 10, verse 11, prophesying too, he says, a serious pride will be brought down. The wisest of all, King Solomon, actually had this to say, Proverbs 16, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. There's much to learn in pride. One of the hardest things in life is to keep reminding one another of being humble, right? But we do the darndest things. Because in our way of saying be humble, we also act to try to make us proud. That's the reason there's a spotlight here. That's the reason we put things in the YouTube Nothing wrong, by the way. It's not necessarily pride. But if we're not careful, all these things prop us up. And if I'm not careful, if you're not careful, it can be the start of our downfall. Have you heard of the church named Mars Hill? Or the preacher named Mark Driscoll? Do you know where they are now? They don't exist. Well, Mark Driscoll exists. The church doesn't. Mars Hill was a mega church in Seattle. They had 10,000 in their congregation. They have a dozen satellites throughout the Seattle metro. And every time they have worship, Mark Driscoll is beamed into the 12 satellites. But over the years that the church grew, so quickly, power began to be more and more centralized. Power began to be more and more mobilized by those at the top in order to control outcomes, in order to ensure that the DNA gets somehow transmitted to the next satellite, the next satellite, and the next satellite. And the environment of running the show became so harsh that even the associate pastors began to notice a few things. Now, I'm not judging. It's simply there for you to see and read. But there's a lesson, a very powerful lesson for you and for me. Mark Driscoll had to step down, resign. And the very next Sunday of worship, when the new committee came up, the head of that committee simply announced, Church, this will be our final worship service. The church will disband from this moment on. And the satellites, you're free 
to merge with other searches. You're free to become yourself. You can disband as you wish. But Mars Hill is no more. Pride goes before destruction. When power and pride are left unchecked, be careful. And that's a reminder to me. And that's why I'm grateful for Pastor Irwin, for Dario, who's there to tell me. And you're there to tell me too, right? Please do. Because I'm going to need it. We all need it. How do we take the air out of the acts? Four things as my suggestions to us this morning. Don't put people on pedestals is my first. You see, you can't look up and down at the same time. In a pedestal, the chances are you'll be looking down more frequently than you are looking up. Because by looking up, your balance somehow begins to teeter. In a pedestal, you'll keep looking down. And pride keeps us looking down on things, looking down on people in order to make us feel better about ourselves, superior than others. And so when that happens, it clouds my vision of God and elevates my vision of who I am. And so when you place someone on a pedestal, you know what? You create an incredibly heavy burden on that person's shoulder. And one day, you too will be disappointed. Don't put people on pedestals. Now that's going to be hard for you, Filipino. And that's going to be harder on you who live in L.A. Because Filipinos love idols. We love celebrities. We're fashioned after Hollywood. We're faster when it comes to who's the next star. And that is why you and I need to be extra careful because our culture adores celebrity. And when we're placed in a society like Los Angeles, even more. Even more. Therefore, be careful. So here's the second thing. Cultivate accountable relationships. And the reason I say that is this. It's so difficult to come alongside a person and say, I see pride in you. Right? So difficult. And the kind of response you get, Sino ka ba? Who are you? To tell me that. You too are a proud I mean, that is the usual, common, natural response, right? And therefore, we'd rather not but in healthy, accountable relationships, you do. Just like former President Clinton. You remember, two weeks ago or three weeks ago, Bill Clinton and George W. Bush were actually interviewed in Camp, whatever that is, in Texas. You know, George Bush home. And they were being interviewed, and the topic was humility. Can you imagine? Humility. These two former presidents, and after I think that interview, Bill Clinton went out to take a picture between these two statues of George Bush and George W. Bush. Well, here's what Clinton and George Bush had to say in that interview. They said something like this. Those who are real arrogant in office have forgotten that history will be their judge. Another thing they said, you want to be able to say, people were better off when I quit. You don't want to say, God, look at all the people I beat. You see, now they can joke to one another because it makes a lot of difference when you're looking back. You can say, you've been there and I've been humiliated. And you learn the lessons the hard way. And so in that accountable relationship, is the third thing. Call out pride where it emerges. Yes, and we need to do that. Howard Butley, the man who owned this great 
supermarket chain in Texas. H-E-B, have you heard of that? Howard E. Butt, it comes from his name, H-E-B. Howard Butt was actually a great philanthropist. He's a Christian. And he wrote an article entitled, The Art of Being a Big Shot. And he said something like this. It is not just a matter of pride being an unfortunate little trait and humility being an attractive little virtue. It's my inner psychological integrity that's at stake. When I am conceited, I'm lying to myself about what I am. I am pretending to be God and not man. My pride is the idolatrous worship of myself. And that is the national religion of hell. Call it out when you see it. I'll be the first to thank you when you call it out in me. Probably the more important thing is this. Let Christ kill the pride in us because he's the only one who can do it. He's the only one through his word who can make us self-aware of who we, are, who we are when we look at the mirror of our hearts. So let Christ kill the pride in you. You remember the story of the Boston Celtics coach by the name of Casey Jones. During the era of Larry Bird, Kevin McHale, and all those guys, Boston Celtics were down in the dying seconds of the game, down by one point, only a few seconds left in the game. Coach Casey Jones calls for a timeout to work on their final play, and at the huddle, Larry Bird, that great and gentle Celtic superstar, still gasping for air, he simply quipped, just give me the ball and get out of the way. And Casey Jones, you know, felt his position, his authority was being challenged. He said, Excuse me, Larry. I am the coach. I call the shots. Now sit down and listen. So Casey Jones lifts the whiteboard to draw the last play. After a pause and without writing anything, he yelled at the players, Get the ball to Larry and get out of his way. <laughs> you know, we have such big egos. And the way to keep it in check is to hand the ball of our lives to Jesus Christ and get out of his way. Lord, let me live my life in and through you. Let's pray. How difficult it is, Lord, to be reminded of something that is insidious. Because even the first mention of pride my first defense tells me it's not about me. It's about somebody else. But it's about me. And so, Lord, have mercy. Have mercy. When this ugly head rears its face, Lord, may Christ remain at the throne of my life. Reminding us, Lord, that you are opposed to the proud. And yet you give grace to the humble. And so thank you for your grace upon us even today. Lord, teach us to be a church who will truly care for one another. How we care so much for one another that we can call out pride when it exists among us. So help us to understand humility in all its splendor as we see the grace of God unfolding in our ways, in our minds, in our church. Thank you, Lord, for working in us. In Jesus' name, amen.